Let me ask uh, people in the audience, uh, is anybody here using kilohertz lasers for any purpose? Do we, do we have any kilohertz people? Okay. Okay, we have a few kilohertz. Um, uh, you can buy kilohertz lasers. They're fairly expensive, but you buy them and you unpack them and you turn them on and they work. You know, so it's uh, the uh, the good ones are made in Germany by Edge Wave. They're very expensive, and uh, if you live in a country besides Germany, you have to send them back whenever they need to be fixed. And unfortunately, these kilohertz lasers need to be fixed all the time. <laughs> like once a year. So my most recent grad student, one of his major jobs was to learn how to package up the laser in a big crate, <laughs> send it in a special shipping, uh, and this was only to California because we bought the, the California version, and uh, um, it just took him forever because it had to be insured. You know, this, it's over $100,000, so you know. The poor grad student, um, had lots of issues with these. But when they're working, they're very nice. And you can buy the, uh, uh, the, the uh, California version from Quantronics, which is part of spectrophysics. And uh, they're cheaper, and they don't do as much as the edge wave from Germany. But it depends on your budget. OK. Um, Another, uh, oh, the other group is down in Dayton, Ohio. They have uh, pulse burst lasers, which are even more expensive, and they do uh, very short pulses of, of laser, laser bursts. Um, uh, uh, you know, so you may get um, uh, 40 kilohertz, 40,000 uh, pulses per second, but only for a short time. And then the lasers rest, and build up energy, and then they do another 40,000 per second. Um, so you, you know, they, that's, a, that's another option. Um, you can buy them from a company in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, more and more labs are getting them. But now, you know, the real big issue that everybody's trying to wrestle with is what do you do with all this kilohertz data? You've got a movie. You may get a thesis out of it. But how do you write a paper? Do, do you really need kilohertz and some problems, of course, you do, and others you don't. Uh, this, is, this is the one that uh, Yun Tao Chen, were in my group, used, um, where he has a, a, a 355 nanometer um, laser to look at formaldehyde plif, and this tells us where the flame is. And then he has a green PIV laser to get the velocity field. And the experiment that he was running is a, a GTMC burner, which was uh, designed in DLR in Stuttgart. And this is Wolfgang Meyer's burner. He, he um, graciously let us use his drawings. And um, it has an, it's a gas turbine type combustor run on methane. And it uh, has an acoustic instability, just like Professor Kandel has been telling you about. So you hear this noise coming out of it. It's kind of a humming noise. A, a loud hum, one frequency, and um, uh, you can see the flames flopping at uh, 300 hertz. And so that's one application where you need kilohertz lasers if, if you have a highly unsteady, uh, especially periodic, uh, uh, flame. Now, the way the uh, PIV often is uh, done is with frame straddling. You have a camera and it's taking images. The camera is open when these, uh, at the times when the boxes are shown. So the camera is open. And then in between the box, the camera is closed. There's a shutter on the camera. Um, and so the camera is operating at 20,000 images per second. And the, um, you have two lasers. Each is operating at 10,000 pulses per second. So uh, one laser pulse, laser one uh, is fired when the image one is recorded, and then laser two is fired when image two is recorded. And then you wait a little while, and then um, laser one fires again, and laser two fires. So uh, 
Um, in this way, um, you only need one camera. And that's kind of nice because uh, when you do PIV, you have to have the, if you use two cameras, you have to have them perfectly registered. So you're going to see a picture of particles at one time in one camera. And if you have a second camera, you have pictures of particles at another time. You want to know how far did the particles move. If the two cameras aren't looking exactly at the same location in space within uh, you know, microns, you can't do it. So it's much I'd say it's better, or it's often done with one camera because you automatically, all the images are automatically registered and they, all the images are exactly the same region in space. But um, if you want to fire the lasers uh, with a delta T between the two pulses, you want this delta T to be small. So you want delta T to be delta x over u, where delta x is the distance the particle moves, which is about a third of the interrogation box. Now, an interrogation box with PIV is, is a, um, typically a, like a, well, I've, I've shown here um, uh, uh, 0.3 millimeters by 0.3 millimeters. So it's a little box in space. And uh, you will get one velocity vector for each interrogation box at each uh, instant in time. And so you can get velocity vectors that are separated by 0.3 millimeters, which is pretty good resolution. Uh, but um, what that means is if you want a lot of these little vectors, you need to have a small delta t. And um, if the velocity is 50 meters per second, then Delta T has to be two microseconds, which is short. And that means the camera has to go off and go back on again in two microseconds. That puts a limitation on the cameras. But the, the current cameras can do that. So this is sort of the design of how you image, uh, uh, how you get PIV images. And if you're doing PIV, you know, you get an image of particles in image one, and you get an image in particles, uh, image of little particles in image two, and then you do a correlation mapping to see, on average, where do those particles go, and you get, in one interrogation box, you might have like uh, 20 particles, and so you sort of see, on average, where did those 20 particles go, and then you, the average of their displacement would give you one vector in that 0.3 millimeter interrogation box averaged over, let's say, 20 particles. Uh, the other thing that um, people have to learn to do is to process the PLIF signals. So if you, if you take a formaldehyde signal, for example, and it tells you where formaldehyde is in space, um, um, oftentimes you have to learn to find out where is the edge of that signal. and um, um, if the signal is too weak, it may not be a flame, and if it's strong, it may be a flame. So, um, you know, uh, you have to learn how to threshold properly to get the background light out. And uh, we use uh, edge detection algorithms, which come with MATLAB, so it's pretty straightforward. But um, you do need to use some judgment as far as what's the edge of the PLIF signal and where's the background noise? And uh, so that's a, 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 a somewhat of an issue. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, the best way to do it is to use a laminar flame where you know exactly where the edge of the flame is. And you apply the laser diagnostics to the laminar flame. And then you say, well, there's some, some signal that's sort of floating around in the background. It's not right. And then there's a lot of strong signal that is right. Where is the boundary between the bad and the good? And you have to sort of decide using a laminar flame 
and then you apply the same criteria to the turbulent flame. But um, um, that's about the best that, that we can do. Um, but it's like finding the edge of a, a Gaussian, you know. I mean, at some point, you got to just cut it off. It's somewhat of a research issue still, you know, how, how, to, how to determine where exactly is the flame boundary. Oh, um, uh, I see. I think I know what you're saying now. The dotted line is, uh, is our threshold. Um, we're arguing also that the gradient is important, that if you have a flame, um, it, it should have, you should have a sharp gradient in the uh, PLIF signal. Uh, so if you, if, you, um, if you have just a, um, a signal that's all over the place, uh, um, it's a big blob of signal, um, that would be sort of no gradient at all. Uh, the argument is that, that that must not be a flame. Okay. And, it, and there again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a laminar flame, you can check to see if you, you ever see that. But um, generally, a flame is sort of defined as enough signal from formaldehyde and the gradients are sufficiently large. Yeah, let me try to repeat your question that in a counterflow flame, you're seeing formaldehyde, um, and it peaks. Uh, now, um, I guess I would argue that um, if you see a large gradient, I mean, a flame causes a gradient in formaldehyde. So if the gradient is about the level that you would expect, maybe by doing a Chemkin calculation, and if the signal is sufficiently large compared to any background noise, uh, then I guess you could confidently claim that that's the flame. But um, um, I think most of the time we do use both, uh, you know, a criterion for cutoff of intensity and a and gradient, and it is somewhat subjective. Now. Um, let me show this movie. Whoops, I lost it. Um, this is a movie taken by uh, Cam Carter and Tong Hun Lee. Um, uh, Cam Carter is at the Air Force Lab. Tong Hun Lee is a professor at Illinois. And uh, one of his students and, one, and two of my students uh, took this movie. Uh, but Cam Carter is the one who really set it up in, it's a 10 kilohertz edge wave German made laser. And what he found was that if you go to uh, 314 nanometers, which is the, um, it, it's a way to excite uh, CH, but it's a new way of doing it. He found that you got really good signal and it's incredibly high quality. It's, it looks better on my screen than up here. But uh, Cam Carter invented this new method. Now, it's the CX band. Now, X means uh, the ground state of the molecule. A would be the first electronically excited state. B is the second, and C is the third. So you're exciting the electron in the CH molecule from ground state up to the third excited state. And normally, you don't do that. You, Normally, you only excite it to the first excited state because you usually get the most signal that way. But uh, Cam Carter discovered this wavelength that works really, really well. Um, yeah. No, no, no. It's 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 uh, lower than that. Yeah. It the, you you have to go a few more up before you dissociate CH. But even if it dissociated. It doesn't matter because even if you destroy the CH molecule, you're still probing what it was. The signal you get out is depends on, uh, well, let me see. 
you're probing what what you hit initially, uh, but it does have to go up to an excited state and come back down and give you a photon. But you're arguing that the signal you get out finally is due to how many CH molecules were there before the laser hit it. Yeah. That's right. You can get you could you get very little signal that way, yeah. But and since he gets a lot of signal, he's fairly sure that it, he's not anywhere near the he's not dissociating, he's not breaking the CH into C and H, which you could do with these lasers. Anyway, um, he published a paper on this great technique, and and then my students and Professor Lee's students came down and we, we did our turbulent flame and looked at it. And uh, I mean, let me, uh, <coughs> I don't know why my cursor isn't working here, but uh, um, this is a very high Reynolds number turbulent flame. There are four different fields of view and we just stacked them on top of each other. So um, you can see there's a break and uh, you see um, at the break, it looks like it kind of uh, have, you have broken reactions, but there is no broken reaction really. Uh, the 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 lines are continuous. It's corrugated in that these little islands are formed everywhere, and it's very very wrinkled. But um, now um, it's sort of time resolved. You can sort of see what's happening from shot to shot. But we'd like to have better resolution than this, you know, because it's kind of jerky and jumpy. And, and um, uh, this, is, this is the um, lower, um, lower Reynolds number flame where it's better resolved and it, it looks like it's going slower. And so you can see where things are going. Um, um, as, I, as I said, um, Cam d discovered this uh, uh, new band, uh, exciting at 314 nanometers, and um, these are some of the specs. And uh, you can look up the applied physics paper if you're interested in doing this yourself. Um, and then Adam Steinberg's about uh, seven or eight years ago, when he was at Michigan, he he ran a um, uh, uh, a kilohertz PIV system, but it was at a, at a lower Reynolds number of flame. And um, he pulsed the lasers at 110 pulses a second. He did frame str straddling, as I said. And um, he was looking at that flame in the upper right. And um, uh, he didn't have the fancy diagnostics that Cam Carter has today. This was seven or eight years ago. and. Uh, um, and so, you know, he generated these pictures, which I believe I showed last time, but um, it showed vortices going through a flame, but um, we were limited in how fast the flame could be uh, propagating and how much turbulence level and the repetition rate. And so he, he wanted to get enough uh, images such that you could sh show the flame going through the, the vortices going through the flame. The um, blue and the red regions are vorticity that, that is opposite sign. And um, you got his thesis out of this. Um, one of the things that you know you can get out of kilohertz is you can see where the vortex pair is, where does it disappear, and when does the wrinkle occur. So what he, what he found was that here's a strong vortex pair. It will start to wrinkle this flame, but then it will disappear as it goes through the flame. And I think maybe I saw that in the last one. Let me see if we can see that. Uh, you, you, can see that you can see that these, these eddies go through the flame, but after they get through the flame, they pretty much disappeared because it's highly viscous in the products. So, so the flame just sort of um, destroys these eddies. 
And when you think about it, uh, what viscosity does is it spreads things out in space. And so if you imagine a really tight vortex spinning around and you spread it out with diffusion, you'll probably keep the circulation constant. Now, circulation is the amount of vorticity um, in the entire region integrated over the area. So, so it's just like taking a really tightly wound vortex and taking that same uh, rotational kinetic energy and spreading it out. Sort of like, a, like if you have a bathtub problem, you have all this vorticity that's spread out over a big region, and then when you put it down the drain, it becomes really tight and intense. This is sort of the opposite, where the vorticity spreads out. So you're not, you may not be losing kinetic energy of, of the uh, rotation, but you're spreading it out in space by the flame. Okay, and uh, well, these are some more pictures that he took, and he was able to um, um, try to take some of these images and compare them to some computations. And um, you can see a wrinkle caused by a counter-rotating eddy pair, and he just wanted to make sure that the eddies were rotating in the way that we thought, and he compared this to uh, flame vortex simulations, and, and, um, and then um, and at, at other times he saw uh, lots of eddies all coming at the same time, and uh, sometimes they, in this bottom row, they, <coughs> the eddies seem to <coughs> um, counteract each other, and you don't get the wrinkling that you expect. Another thing he looked at, which is kind of fun because um, it ties into theory, is that uh, these, these pictures in the, on, the, on the left in the middle are uh, Adam's measurements. Um, he's, he can get the velocity uh, streak lines, which means you just take the, the velocity vectors and, and sort of follow them along. They're not necessarily streamlines, but um, um, from the PIV vectors, if you just connect the dots, you get these lines. And you can see that uh, the, the flame is, uh, is uh, distorted, and the streak lines look like this. And then if you go to uh, Foreman Williams' textbook on combustion, you see exactly the same picture. And he calls this his description of a Landau instability. But what's a Landau instability? All flames are unstable. If you just have a perfectly flat laminar flame, if no other forces were acting on it, it would become unstable. It would wrinkle. If it was perturbed a little bit, it would, the, the amplitude would grow. Now, the way uh, Landau described it is uh, the following. So suppose you put a wrinkle in a premixed flame, uh, like I've shown here. Uh, the velocity of uh, the gas uh, except, uh, is high on the product side, and it's about six times higher than the velocity coming at the flame on the reactant side, because rho u is constant in the normal direction. So I drew those vectors to show that you get a high velocity normal to the flame, away from the flame. But the, the, the vectors have to bend and go straight up, far away from the flame, so I drew them to bend up. And that's what uh, Professor Williams drew in that picture. Now, by conservation of mass, if you take any segment, if you break up a, a, a sinusoidal-looking flame, uh, what comes in has to go out uh, between those two dotted lines. And so you can argue, then, the streamlines on the streak lines on the reactant side should look like this. They, um, uh, uh, by conservation of mass, uh, those streamlines have to look the way they are. And that's what uh, Landau argued. And now, if you have a subsonic flow, and you go from a large area to a smaller area as you go towards the flame, upward, the velocity will increase. Rho ua is a constant, 
rho is a constant in the reactants, and A is getting smaller as the as the, the, the reactants go to a smaller and smaller area. So I drew this vector um, getting larger as it goes up. But the uh, uh, flame is propagating at a certain speed, and that's the vector going down. And because this streamline pattern now is forcing the reactants to go faster at the flame, they're going to push the flame up. So where is the flame going to go in the next instant? It's going to go upward at the tip there because the gas coming at it is going faster than its propagation speed. So uh, Lando argued that any time a flame is wrinkled by any perturbation, the wrinkle will increase in time, and therefore it's unstable. So we'd ask, well, how do we ever get a laminar flame? Well, let, yeah, let me just say that. Uh, how do you get a laminar flame? You have to have something else like buoyancy. And so if you add buoyancy to all this, the buoyancy will prevent this from happening. And you know this because if you take the same flat flame and you tip it upside down, I can guarantee it will not stay nice and laminar. So, so uh, Lando's right, but uh, it's not the only mechanism. OK, a question? For what? Uh, oh, that's a that's a great question. Yeah. Now there's another phenomenon. That's the uh, the um, um, thermodiffusive instability. Yes. If it, if it was uh, in thermodiffusively stable, that would overcome the uh, Landau instability. But if yeah, if it's thermodiffusively unstable, then that would add to the this uh, instability. So the at least three instabilities going on. Um, thermodiffusive, Landau, and buoyancy. And, and maybe others. Uh, but um, we do know that we can get um, uh, you know, a laminar looking Bunsen flame when you, when you do your chemistry experiments. So you know that buoyancy, at least, is uh, extremely strong and helpful. And, uh, and uh, you can get a laminar no matter what the uh, Lewis number. So I think buoyancy is dominant. But this is, this is interesting because uh, uh, um, now what, what, what Adam argued is that um, he sees wrinkling even after the vortex is long gone. So what, what he appears to see from his data is that at early times, he calls it a domkohler like wrinkling, where it's just like this picture I drew yesterday where you have this counter-rotating vortex pair, and they wrinkle the flame as they cross the flame. But at later times, this vortex pair is destroyed, and it's no longer there. But then he sees in his data that the flame continues to get more and more wrinkled. So it's, it's um, most likely, or we believe it could be due to this hydrodynamic wrinkling. And um, so what, uh, what Adam did with his thesis data was he, he looked at the strain curvature correlation. And as it turns out, that um, it, um, if, this, if this correlation is a negative, then it's, it's, it's this uh, vortex pair that's wrinkling the flame. And if this correlation is positive, then it's hydrodynamic. At least it, it, it can be explained by the, dom, the, uh, the Landau instability. And so he, he's arguing that regime one, since this strain curvature correlation is negative in the data, uh, it's Domkohler wrinkling. And in regime three, it's hydrodynamic wrinkling. In regime two, it seems to be uh, transitioning. But what this means is that if you really want to do a good model, you might want to include uh, the uh, Landau instability in the model, but most models don't. Anyway, another thing that you can do with this kind of kilohertz data is uh, you can assess various uh, quantities in various models. Now, uh, the flame surface density models um, define sigma to be the flame area per unit volume, and they write an equation like this. 
this is a simple version of it, where sigma is area per unit volume, and so d sigma dt is area per second per unit volume. And okay, there's convection, there's diffusion, but the source term now is the stretch rate. So we're arguing that uh, the rate at which the area of the flame is increasing due to velocity field and curvature can lead to um, creation of flame surface area. So K is 1 over A d A d T, where A is the surface area of the flame. And as you saw in the movie, that the turbulence is really wrinkling this flame and getting it, uh, giving it a lot of area. Now, K times sigma is the rate at which uh, we're producing sigma. Now, K is 1 over A d A d T, and sigma is area per unit volume. And they see the two areas cancel out, and so you get d A d T per unit volume, and that's exactly the dimensions of d sigma d T. So uh, this equation seems to be dimensionally correct. That's good. Uh, but that sort of explains what, what that source term is. Now, M is a merging term, and as the flamelets get too close together, they merge and disappear. Now, from that movie, we, we can actually measure the merging rate. Um, and uh, that's what one of the students in, in my group is trying to extract from that movie. Um, there's also a quenching rate, Q, and that would be the rate at which uh, surface area is lost by extinction. But we don't see any, and so Q is zero for uh, most of our data set. But that's a nice equation. Um, you know, with kilohertz lasers, now we can pretty much measure all the terms in the equations. And um, we're not quite there, but that's we're working on. And Adam also, um, he took uh, uh, some of his PIV images and he said, well, let's suppose I'm a, a modeler and I am doing large eddy simulation. I would break up my field into a bunch of cells. And so he broke up his experimental data into cells. And he tried to extract information averaged over each cell and try to relate it to the properties at the boundaries of each cell. So if you, um, if you um, um, do the proper averaging over the cell, you determine the, the subgrid average properties. And you would then assign it to, let's say, one corner of the cell. So let's say we take one cell, let's say a rectangle, and the, let's say the upper left corner, that would be the resolve scale point. So if you had a computer code, you would determine values on every uh, corner of each of these cells, but you couldn't figure out what's inside each cell because that's subgrid, okay? And so you had to do, use a model that relates whatever's happening inside the cell, and then it has to be related to the properties that are on the corners of the cell, which you can resolve with the, your computer. And, and so he's, um, he's, um, he's trying to sort of do what uh, DNS people do, but um, um, uh, with experimental data. Oops. OK. So. Uh, well, uh, what is this stretch rate, 1 over A d A d t? You know, it's, it's hard to say what's the area of the flame and how fast is the area changing. Because you can't just take two points and just say this is points on a flame and they go here. There's no, there's no boundary to the flame. It's just a, a surface. Um, Professor Law, who introduced all of you, has and Professor Kandel, actually, I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. Uh, Professor Kandel developed this equation, and Professor Law developed this equation sort of separately. And this is a classic equation. It shows that 
mathematically, the, you, the rate at which a, uh, a, a wrinkle surface uh, changes in time depends on three terms. Um, the first term is the um, strain rate term. N is the normal to the surface pointing towards the reactants. Del is the divergence operator. U is the velocity vector just upstream of the flame in the reactants. Del dot U is uh, the divergence of the velocity field in the reactants. And in the reactants, the density is constant. And so that term is 0. And so we're talking about the stretch rate uh, on an upstream boundary of the flame. And del dot n is the curvature. It's related to the curvature of the flame. And uh, has the dimensions 1 over length. And so it's 1 over the radius of curvature. And SML is the propagation speed. So um, can we measure this in turbulent flames? And the answer is uh, sort of. Um, we can only do things in one plane because we only have a laser sheet that's in one plane. Uh, nobody has tried three-dimensional measurements. Um, so the radius of curvature will be the two-dimensional radius of curvature. And um, uh, so um, we sort of can do this. But what, uh, what Adam did was um, um, he plotted the um, stretch exerted on the flame averaged over the cell, so it would be a subgrid stretch rate integrated over the cell. And he's trying to relate it to quantities at the corners of the cell. And what the modeling people, they don't use velocity, they use strain rate. And S sub delta is the strain rate um, uh, integrated over the cell. And um, that's what he plots on the x-axis, the strain rate integrated over the, the cell, and then the stretch efficiency function, which is, uh, uh, um, uh, I guess I didn't define that totally here, but it's, it's, it's a quantity used in the subgrid model. But then to relate the, the uh, S delta to the properties at the edge of the cell, you need the Smagorinsky assumption. So the, um, the upshot of this is basically, with the experimental data, you can, you can measure some curves that can help the uh, LES people to relate subgrid properties to resolve scale properties. Now, uh, this is still a uh, type of work that is um, still being done. So it's um, not clear um, you know, which models can benefit, and everybody's model is different. And so there is an effort, though, to, to use kilohertz lasers to get good subgrid scale models. Um, the, 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 yeah, here's a, oh, here's a, uh, the closure. The subgrid S delta is related to the resolve scale. Um, this is a Smagorinsky type relation. So if you, if you um, combine the theory and the experimental data, you can hopefully, um, um, uh, you know, you can get a, a subgrid model that is better than uh, what we have. But this whole, uh, this, this, this whole um, attempt to use measurements is only valid for one type of model, the, one that, the model that uses the flame surface density. So other modelers couldn't care less about this. You know? So that's one of the problems with the, the research in this area is that you sort of have to pick the model that you like. You try to help them with your measurements. And, um, and then other experimentalists will try to help other modelers. And maybe then we can get better models. So um, we can get stretch rate measurements, which are needed in models that 
have a, uh, an equation that includes stretch rate. Um, any flame interaction measurements are needed to assess the physics of, uh, of, of DNS and LES. Um, um, uh, we might say, why would you assess DNS? DNS is, ac is exact, right? Well, the DNS uh, is not exact. Uh, uh, it may have periodic boundary conditions, and maybe those aren't good boundary conditions. Um, um, the DNS may have uh, complex chemistry, but if the flame is extinguishing, you may need more complex chemistry than what you got, you know? So, I mean, it's hard to say how much chemistry you need to simulate extinction. Uh, so we do need a kilohertz PIV and kilohertz PLIF to get a handle on extinction. Um, it's also good to sort of understand if uh, this uh, Dom Kohler wrinkling, of, you know, as eddies go through, is obviously a good idea, and it's good to have experimental data that proves that. Uh, but the Landau instability is also a good idea, and it appears to be um, causing this correlation that Adam measured even after the flame has, even after the eddy is gone and the flame continues to wrinkle. And then I'll put up another picture. You know, when, when Adam was about to leave, he said, I want to do some 3D work. And uh, so he did. Um, now, uh, there may be better ways of doing this today, but what he did was he took this laser sheet and he uh, had it be horizontal, as I've shown in the middle. And so the eddies are going directly up into the sheet and through the sheet. And so here are the eddies in the, uh, in the vertical sheet um, in this picture with the red and the blue. Then you imagine now those eddies now going up through a, a horizontal sheet. But now with uh, kilohertz lasers, we can take a high-speed movie of this eddy pattern going up through the sheet. And so if you just imagine um, like a football just going up through the sheet, you're slicing it. Uh, every time it moves up, you see a different size circle. And so you could reconstruct what that three-dimensional object looks like based on a movie of many, many images of the two-dimensional structure. But you have to apply Taylor's hypothesis. You have to assume that the, the football doesn't change its shape as it goes through the sheet. Well, if we do that, you know, Adam was able to get lots of these interesting three-dimensional toroidal vortex rings. Um, I'm just showing you some of these. Uh, we never did figure out what to do with this. I mean, uh, it's, it's fun to look at, and it's a way of doing 3D work. I guess I would say that um, there are many good people looking at 3D tomography and 3D uh, methods. Uh, I'm not sure we know exactly what to do with 3D stuff other than to maybe improve on the 2D work that's been done. And then... Uh, Okay, to finish up, um, another student working with me, Ansis Upatniks, uh, looked at a jet, and he um, saw the turbulence moving uh, towards the lifted flame. And at the time, this was done in 2002, so this was a long time ago, long, long time ago. And um, the, the little red and blue eddies are the, the a scene, and those are, that's vorticity, and the uh, white is the uh, burn gas from the lifted jet flame base. At the time, it was thought that the flame was just jumping between eddies, that the, somehow the uh, eddies um, um, formed like little places where the flame would like to stabilize, and so the flame would just jump from one eddy to another. And that was published in papers, and uh, it's not what he saw. Uh, it was also argued that the, um, the, that the turbulence, the turbulent eddies were making the flame go faster at the base, 
But what we saw, the most of the eddies don't even interact with the base, that they go up uh, inside the base. Uh, they stay radially inside the base. And um, uh, and so um, um, what this really suggests is that uh, the, the, the base of the flame is now, we don't know that it's a triple flame, but we would suspect that it's a triple flame somewhere and that it's actually lying in a very low turbulence region, maybe even a laminar triple flame that's sitting there. And uh, uh, these eddies are not really the cause of the liftoff or the blowout. So uh, there were four or five theories that existed at that time, and uh, these kinds of movies can help to dispel and throw out some of the theories, but uh, they don't always prove uh, which theory is right. So to finish up, I'll say that um, uh, well, well, actually, uh, maybe I'll just finish up and, and do this another time. So why don't we quit, since it is time to quit. And if, if anybody has any questions, you can come up and see me right after the, right, right now, OK?